Hey you guys, this is Josh with Homesteading Family and welcome to this episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. I'm really excited. Today I've got Dr. Patrick Jones visiting with us and for those of you that don't know him, he is a veterinary and an herbologist. Is that the right way to say that? That's a, a way people say it and that works too. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> herbologist or herbalist or... Uh, yeah, and, and he just has some phenomenal experience with herbs, with animals, with people. And um, so, Patrick, just tell us a little bit for, for folks that maybe uh, haven't been introduced to you, uh, just about yourself, a little bit of a bio. So, um, yeah, I'm Patrick Jones. I live down in southern Idaho, about 12 hours south of here, uh, near Twin Falls. But we're, uh, I'm a veterinarian. I've been a practicing veterinarian for just over 30 years. Um, and I've done everything, you know, s small animals, dairy cows, beef cows, hogs, poultry, just uh, really literally everything. Um, and uh, I'm also an herbalist. And so a lot of what I do in the veterinary practice is with herbal medicine. I find that the herbs are sometimes vastly more uh, useful tools than pharmaceuticals. And I use pharmaceuticals too. Um, but sometimes herbs can do things that drugs can't do. Yeah. You know. Uh, but uh, so we do that. I also am a naturopath. I went to naturopath school, and so I had a human practice as well. So, but we run a we have a an online school of herbal medicine, the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine, and uh, homegrownherbalist.net dot net is the site if anyone wants to look that up. But yeah, so we've just done a lot of things. Being a veterinarian has given me a lot of latitude as an herbalist to kind of do whatever I want. To, yeah, to you be know? able to really learn how to use those herbs in a context without worry about, you know, yeah. I mean, some of the medical regulations or whatever. Yep. And, um, and, it, and, and we'll get into that a little bit. And actually today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, animal first aid and herbology on, on the farm and some ways to naturally treat your animals. Yeah. Um, but, but first, we usually catch up with everybody, Carolyn and I do, uh, with what's going on with us kind of behind the scenes yeah. and, and on the farm. And so, you know, um, besides being up here, which he, he, he came up and uh, graciously taught a class last night to the homeschool group on uh, Herbal First Aid, and uh, we've been filming some other projects here. But besides that, um, what have you been up to? What's your what's your day-to-day -day look like, and what's interesting and going on the last <laughs> couple weeks? As far as the herb company, we're doing a lot of harvesting, and you know we're all up to our ears in that right now. You know, we'd grow a lot of our own stuff. Um, so you're selling, let me, let me just back up a little bit, because you, you besides treating people in a practice, you sell tinctures and, and yep. herbs, and and I think this is really cool. You're growing a lot of this, so you're not. I mean, I know you you probably have to bring some in, but a sure, lot of it sure. you actually are growing yourself that you're providing to people. Yeah, we are, and we're we're growing as much of it as we can on our own. Um, That's and cool. uh, it's a vastly different product. I mean, it's just oh yeah. You know, if you if you harvested stuff from here and dried it a year from now, it'd be twice as aromatic as anything you bought online yeah you know it's just a different product kind of like our food right for yeah. those of us that raise a lot of our exactly. food i mean yeah we're wanting you know health and yeah and some food security but the experience and the quality and the flavor yeah and what's there is just it doesn't compare to anything you can get in the store yep and you know it's the same exact issue as you know food industrial f commercial food production yeah and the same thing's happening with the herb industry you know they've got a field of you know, peppermint or whatever it is, and they're harvesting it with a combine, and the, it's getting dried in a big commercial dryer, and, you know, yeah. it's just sadly a little similar to what's happening to our food supply. <laughs> and who knows how old it is. You mentioned yeah. this last night. By the time it gets, you know, into that capsule, into the bottle, onto the store shelf, and to you, yeah. uh, you know, it's, what, probably a couple years old a lot yeah, of times. Well, yeah, I was talking to a gentleman a few months ago who's a commercial grower for an herb company. He says, none of my stuff is in a package for a year. Wow. You know? Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's too bad, you know, and they're doing their best. I mean, you sure. know, they're doing yeah, what they can do, and I don't, I don't mean to pick on them, but, um, and there's huge need and huge demand, and what do you do? But it's just a very different, you know, just like you're, you know, we had dinner with you guys last night, yeah. and it was as good a salad and better vegetables than I've had you know, anywhere commercial or, or sure. restaurant, you know. <laughs> well, and it's, I mean, what you're saying is just another piece to me in the thought of creating more regional 
food systems and and even in this case herb systems and and because you can you know grow it and get it to people in a shorter amount of time and it's more yep. effective it's more powerful and that really just argues that we need more people doing what you're doing not just the homesteading but growing the herbs so that right. there's a better product out there yeah. not just this mass commercially produced product. yeah it, it makes a big difference and and you know one of the things we emphasize in the school is helping people realize it's not that hard to grow herbs and they could be producing a lot of medicine on their own property very easily oh. you know carolyn's got this adorable yeah. cottage garden here that's not very big it's not very big but, it's not but very it produces old. it would produce a ton of medicine yeah you know and you've yeah. got really all the bases covered we went through it the other day I didn't yeah. see anything in there that I was saying, oh, holy cow, she sure better get some of this or she'll be in trouble someday. Right. Yeah. She's got all the bases covered. She's got it well covered. covered, and that's less than 1,000 square feet, and it's got, you know, it's got medicinals in it. It's got culinaries in it. It's got cutalls in it, so it's not all even going to medicinals. And, yeah. and you guys, this was, if you haven't seen the video a few years ago, this was lawn. This was like what we're sitting on, and literally in one year, this, I mean, it's much more robust now after a couple of years of maturing, but it only took one season. I mean, literally yeah. in May... We, we covered the ground and did a no-till um, layered system, kind of Paul Gauchy style. And she had all her starts and planted them. And in the first year, she, th this cottage garden was thriving. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you can go that fast. Yeah, they're amazing Get plants. yourself into your own herbs and... and uh, yeah, well, on our property down in... Uh, we just sold it, actually, when I bought another property that were a bigger property. But we had, you know, it was just a home on... Uh, we probably had a half acre of yard and garden space that we were using. Um, and we had 150 species of medicinals and we're producing tons of stuff. You see that on a half acre? Yeah. See what you guys can do? I mean, 150 yeah. species. And, you know, and the other thing that you can do is all of your landscaping can be medicinal. You oh, know, yeah. the trees, the bushes, the flowers, yeah. you know. <laughs> Most of the plants that you're friends with already are medicinal. You well, know, so. <laughs> you say this garden back here, you know, you you see the hollyhocks, and there's always flowers in here. I mean, yeah. Most of them are medicinal, but there's always something beautiful. So it can be yeah. a beautiful landscape yep. while being extremely useful. Yep. And you can even sprinkle in maybe some of those things that um, aren't medicinal, but that sure. you want in there just to spice it up. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So you guys are so you're harvesting a lot right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that time of year, but <coughs> yeah. Um, and of course, I'm, you know, the I'm doing a lot of writing. You know, uh, I'm writing a couple of books. I'm, I have two books already. Uh, one's just called the Homegrown Herbalist. The other's the Homegrown Herbalist Guide to Medicinal Weeds. But I'm doing one on trees. I'm doing one on spices. The the medicinal value of it's called kitchen medicine. Oh, love you know, it. And everything in your spice drawer is fabulous medicine if i if i can get it through just <laughs> eating food i mean I, yeah. i'm just a foodie i love my food our whole world revolves around our food so if i can just get my medicine that way on yeah. top of nutrient dense food and, and I'm have it in. taste I'm, good i'm sold <laughs> that's right yeah. wow very cool um well let's so let's talk about the farm. A lot of a lot of folks that are listening and watching are on somewhere in their journey of homesteading and generally uh, have animals involved in their systems, you know, anywhere sure. from chickens on up to dairy cow, beef cows. And, um, you know, it's it's something that we really don't have a conversation a lot about is, um, you know, just animal care and animal medicine, you know, from kind of a holistic homesteading perspective, you know, we're, we're trying to be good stewards of the land, good stewards of our animals. And I know for us, one of the reasons we don't have that conversation a lot is, because of the way we do things, having learned from folks like Joel Salatin, where we just, we prevent a lot of problems. Right. You know, we just don't have them if you're doing things well. However, we do have problems occasionally, and as you know, people do. And we have found, and this year we lost two calves, we've had a few chicken problems, and we find ourselves highly unprepared right. for that. Yeah. And so I think this is an exciting discussion. So... Um, I'm not even really sure where to jump off, like to where, where to even begin to to talk about uh, approaching, you know, um, how, how do you just start to think about like from an, from an herbalist perspective, you know, treating animals and thinking about putting together maybe a plan or a system or a method right. to, to incorporate something into your homestead? Well, so the first thing, what you said was extraordinarily important. 
you know, that if you're providing the animals with what they're designed to experience in life, mm. as far as housing and feed and, you know, everything, they're going to have vastly fewer problems. Yeah. You know, if all the humans would would watch a Joel Salatin video and say, hey, why don't I eat like I'm supposed to? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> We'd have a lot fewer problems, Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's really, that's really the thing. And as, as prevention is 90% of the battle yeah. for most things. You know, if you look at, um, and, and, you know, I've been a veterinarian in, in lots of different parts of the country. I was in Minnesota for several years. I was on the Oregon coast in Tillamook for several years. I've been in Southern Idaho now for 25 years. Um, but you know, the small farms in Minnesota, you know, and the, and even the small farms on the Oregon coast had vastly fewer problems with their dairy cows and their pigs and their everything else than the big commercial dairies that I've worked with in Southern Idaho. Mm. You know, a guy in, in Minnesota might have 50 cows. I don't know anymore if they do, but 30 years ago they did. You know, he had 50 cows and he knew them all by name and, yeah. you know, and... It's a different level it, of care. It, it was a different level of care. You know. Uh, versus, you know, the guy in Southern Idaho that has 5,000 cows. Yeah. You know, yeah. and the cows in Minnesota were living, you know, 20 years and milking their brains out for 20 years. And the ones in in these big commercial herds, if they go five years, you feel pretty lucky. Well, and, here you go again, you know, promoting that that more regional, mm -hmm. smaller type system of food production. But yeah. I mean, it works. It and, works. And those guys are profitable, too. Those guys yeah, are they're making, profitable. Making yeah. You I don't mean, have to yeah. be gigantic. When that 20 year old cow goes to heaven, she doesn't know that guy anything. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. she's, she's paid for she's herself it, many, many times. Time. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, so it just starts with good, basic, um, animal husbandry. It really say. does. It, it really does. And that, that's a starting place. And, and just like our own care, right? Our own health starts with taking care of ourselves, eating good yep. food and a good quality good. of life. So we're providing them with good food, a good quality of life. And, and so from there though, you know, we, we do have problems. We do, yep, we run into we injuries. We do run into disease occasionally. Yep. Um, so, and, and the, the, the thing that I have been preaching for my whole career, and nobody seems to believe me, <laughs> is that veterinary herbal medicine and human herbal medicine are almost identical. Veterinary mm -hmm. herbal medicine is actually, you know, might be older than human herbal medicine. You really? know, there's Chinese manuscripts, you know, from like some of the oldest written manuscripts that we have from India and China. Wow. Are talking about veterinary medicine. Wow. You know? Well, yeah. Well, and the so, animals were everything yeah. in their livelihood. Yeah. It's one thing you if your if your kid dies, that's very sad. But if your cow dies, everybody dies. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. and literally true. That's a hard thing for us to relate to today. Yeah. But really, it's only a couple hundred years. Yeah. You know, not even that that animals haven't been absolutely essential to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's a, a very, very, very long history of herbal medicine uh, and traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine from India that goes you know, back many thousands of years. Um, but the fact is that you know, there are a few minor differences. There's a few herbs that you probably shouldn't give your dog, you know, um, you know because sometimes, and it's usually the liver that's the culprit, uh, but sometimes the metabolic pathways in the liver of one species are very different than the liver in another species. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, if you give this guy over here grapes, it might kill him. Yeah. You know, because he turns it into something weird and it melts his kidneys. I, I gotta ask, and this is like a little bit of a tangent, but chocolate. Chocolate. For dogs. Chocolate. Is it for... as bad as people say it is? No. Well, no. It's exactly as bad as it is for humans. Chocolate's got a chemical in it called theobromine, which is very similar to caffeine. Yeah. You know, it's a mild stimulant. The, the problem with a dog is that, you know, if you have a six pound Yorkie and he gets a Hershey bar. A whole bar, <laughs> right, yeah. That's and very different he, than your 12 year old kid eating a whole bar, you know. Right, yeah. it's, it's just a dosage issue. It's okay. not more toxic or more dangerous okay. for him. Well, people, I mean, I've seen people just get really worried about that. Yeah. I mean, it's not like we're going around giving our dogs chocolate. Yeah. And the, better uses for it. But yeah. it, it, I've, I've, I've always sensed that, like, no, nah, I think that's got to be a little bit out there. It is. Okay. And honestly, there's not enough real chocolate in any of our 
chocolate anymore anyway. Yeah. You know, I mean, a Hershey bar, I don't know if the, how much real chocolate's even in a Hershey bar. Yeah. Not that there's know. anything wrong with Hershey bars. If, you, if they're watching, we love Hershey bars. <laughs> but, you know, the real sure. chocolate, wow. the real, yeah. uh, there's not a lot of it in any of the chocolates we're eating in North America anyway. They still eat a lot of it in Europe because they like it stronger, you know. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, it's just a dosing issue. Okay. So, anyways, that, that was a little side tangent, but that's sure. immediately what I thought of with the dogs. I was like, oh, I wonder. He'll know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you were talking about grapes with the dogs and, so, and you know, treating the dogs herbally. In, yeah, in so, so basically, um, when I, just, just as an example, when I created my formulas for Homegrown Herbalist, I, you know, there's probably 80 formulas or something that we have that we're producing regularly. When I created those formulas, I created them uh, so that they could be used in a dog or a chicken or a goat or a cow or a human. And it okay. wouldn't matter. Okay. And, you know, as I look back on those formulas now, um, if I was doing it just for humans, they wouldn't be any different. If I was doing it just for dogs, they wouldn't be any, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there's so much similarity. It's just almost the same thing. Yeah. Um, but we've had uh, just a lot of success over the years taking care of dogs and cats and cows and everything else with herbs. And it's basically the same sorts of things that you would have for your family, you know, maybe a little higher on the wound management end, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have horses because they're yeah. prone to doing dumb things no. and getting hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're real good at getting bad wounds. Yeah. And so, <coughs> you know, basically when I treat a, a horse wound or a cow or whatever it is, you know, they get tangled up in the barbed wire, they run into something and get a big gash. Um, there are some herbs for wound management, in particular, that are phenomenally better than anything pharmaceutical. And these yeah. are these are some of the same that are for human. Yeah, I'm exactly. Say yarrow. The same. Yep. Yarrow to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. You know, calendula, calendula for the infection. Yarrow for the infection too, for that matter. Um, and then comfrey to heal it up faster. Yeah. You know, and if you had if you had those three plants uh, for a wound, and the way I do it, I used to poultice everything. And I would take the plant material, either fresh plant material or, or dried powder mixed with a little water, and I'd poultice it and wrap it, and you know. And uh, I just don't do that at all anymore, hardly. I, I'm nowadays I'm doing everything with a wound spray. Okay. And so basically, what I'm doing is I'm making a tincture out of my poultice formula. Yeah. So it's an alcohol extract of the poultice formula, and I'm spraying that on the wound. Okay. And they're healing up just as fast. So let's let's let's. And it's way can, less work. <laughs> walk through. Oh yeah. Well, I, that's that's the well lay, way less work, but you've also got it on your counter ready to exactly. go, which is very yep. powerful argument. I and mean, it's very nice to have everything fresh out here for sure. Yeah. And you know, if you're there, you can grab it and go. But there's only so much of the year that everything is like this, right? Ready to go, and so that tincture is always going to be ready. So so like for a gen addressing a general wound, you know. For any animal, a dog, a cow, a sheep, you've got, say, just some sort of laceration that's, that's you know, not, you know, you don't need a vet, a surgical, mechanical type process, but you mm -hmm. just need to address the wound. So can you go back to, like, just the basic, you know, what's a basic couple herbs you could have, make a tincture out of, have ready, and, and, and then yeah. just approach a, uh, tackling that wound? Okay, so if I had a wound case, which I've had a zillion wound cases... Uh, and if you want to see some cool wound cases, Yo. go to homegrownerbus.net yeah, go to website. Yeah. and go to the blog. And there's a lot of blog articles about wound cases, animal and human, that we've done. Yeah. Um, and honestly, in my experience, I don't care how big the wound or how bad the wound is. If you got the right herbs, you can heal it up. Yeah. You know, we had a, um, just as one example, we had a, a dog, a little Alaskan Eskimo that got run over. She was an old old dog and not very fast and couldn't see and couldn't hear and you know yeah. <laughs> dad didn't see her when he was backing out of the driveway and she didn't see him yeah well, man. anyway got fun. run over and uh it because of the crushing trauma to the tissue she sloughed all of the skin on her back you know i mean she had a wound that big Whew. you know and there's no way to close that surgically right you know yeah. even if you wanted to and all we did with that dog was herbs you know, she also had multiple pelvic fractures, and all we did was herbs. So three, three. you were talking about three common so, herbs that somebody could make a tincture of. Yeah, so what I would do, so what I did with her topically, when I have a wound case, I address it topically, and I also address it internally. Okay. So we're going to attack that from both sides. 
So topically, we were using the my poultice formula, but it's the same usual suspects in, it, in any any poultice formula. You know, we had that formula has some yarrow in it for bleeding and for anti antibiotic. Um, it has a little in, in, uh, echinacea in it for infection, and it has some uh, plantain for pulling toxins and junk out of it. And it's got a lot of uh, comfrey in it okay. to accelerate healing. Yeah. You know, there's a little pinch of cayenne in there to wake things up and get them moving. There's four basic herbs that you can grow. Yeah. I mean, you can grow them on the side of your house in a small spot Easy. to make it yeah. tincture. And, you know, comfrey, calendula, yarrow, plantain. Yeah. Your, and okay. pinch of cayenne for fun. And topically, I was doing that several times a day. Um, and then internally, I'm going to use very similar, probably the same herbs. You know, I might add a few more things for immune stimulation. I might add a little more echinacea. Um, but, uh, you know, some olive leaf, some other immune stimulating guys. But honestly, those same four herbs internally would do the same job for you. Yeah. You know, um, we have a tendency as, as humans and in general and as herbalists in particular to overcomplicate formulas sometimes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you were, <laughs> you were talking last night. I mean, you made it sound pretty simple that a lot of times for something basic like this, you can just take your jar, you make a tincture in and, and kind of just do equal parts. Yeah. You, know, you said on this one, the comfrey maybe is a, is a, is a little higher ratio. Right. But, but um, and, and then fill that with your tincture, which would be a vodka or something. Right. And, yeah. And, and let that set for a couple of weeks. Yeah, and right? that's really all there is and to strain it. Strain it off and yep. you, you've got your tincture. I mean, and if I'm going to spray a tincture on an open wound, you know, then I'm probably going to dilute it with a little water so it's not too zingy. Okay. You know, because yeah, alcohol exactly. is pretty exciting. Yeah. So what I do is I take a teaspoon of that tincture and I'll put it in two to four ounces of water. Okay. You know, so I get a little four ounce spray bottle, yeah. you know, and I put, you know, ha fill it halfway with water, which is a couple ounces, and then throw a teaspoon of tincture in. And then that, and then once it's mixed with the water, the shelf life of that tincture is about the same as a tea. So it's only good for two or three days. Okay. So you don't want to mix a gallon Once, once it. it's in the water. It's yeah. very shelf stable before no, you put it in the water. No, it'll last 30 years right. in the <coughs> tincture form. So you're going to take that. And so you, you're mixing it kind of enough to use for that wound over a few days. Yeah, and then and I'll mix up some more. it every yeah. day. So just, just to, to put that to work for somebody, and what I'm trying to get to is maybe just somebody's got a little bit of a visual path here. So dealing with a wound, they're gonna stop the bleeding, of course, basic wound care. Right. Um, gonna rinse it, wash it. Right, and and you can rinse it with a tea of those same herbs. Yeah, okay. You know? Yeah, if you've got- That's a wonderful antiseptic, or just some calendula tea. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and so then apply topically your your tincture and then wrap. Yeah, um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Right? I don't I don't usually wrap stuff. Okay. Uh, that would only depend on, um, you know, if it was outdoors and it was fly season, I might. I guess wrap that would stuff. be like on the homestead. Yeah. I'm thinking dust. I'm thinking flies. Yeah. They're still going to have to be out there in their environment. Yeah. So I don't. And know. it just like I say, it just depends completely on how clean it is. Okay. Um, but you know there was a. A, a historical footnote that um, the British had much higher mortality rates with their officers than they did with their enlisted men in the Navy because the officers were getting taken down below and wrapped up and the enlisted guys were laying up on the deck with their wounds open. <laughs> oh, getting air, getting sunshine. So a little air and sunshine is a yeah, good thing. Yeah, <laughs> we, all, we all need oxygen and vitamin D. So, anyway, um, but yeah, if it's, a, if it's a real dirty environment, certainly a bandage is a great idea. Okay. Um, but I, you know, for dog cases, I've, I've never had them wrap a dog wound. Yeah. You know, just spray it. And the more often you do it, the better it works, the faster it yeah, works. So like multiple times a day, yeah. the first few days. Yeah, you yeah. know, whenever you, whenever you think about it, grab that stuff and, and spray it. Yeah. So and you bigger animals on the homestead, probably yeah. twice a day you're gonna it's exactly. hard to do it more than twice a day. No, so and twice a day is process great. Process might be a little slower, but that's gonna work, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also safer for the homesteader yeah. to be doing a spray than to be doing a, a poultice and a bandaging and all that other stuff. You know, if, if you're standing under that horse or that cow, messing yeah. with a wound that's a little tender, yeah. yeah, you know, just blasting it from two feet away is, is Yeah, a well, and that's really nice. You can, you can even safer. get a sprayer bottle that shoots a little more of a stream yeah. if you need to, if you have an animal that's difficult. Yeah, you got a grouch not handleable, yeah. you yep. can still get that in there. And if you've got them at least secured where they can't get far. Yeah. Um, Man, that's exciting. That's just so easy. It really is easy. You know, I mean, we're just talking about one aspect. We obviously can't cover, you know, a whole realm of things. But just thinking about wound care, what you can grow right here, 
and be ready to treat your treat your animals. It's going to heal up quickly. And then in a lot yep. of those cases, would you give them the same herbs internally? Yeah, or I would. Some like dried, have them dried and yep. encapsulated. And just throw them on their feed. Throw no, them on their feed. Okay. Animals are easy to give herbs to. Yeah. You know, with with in the in the small animal practice, unless they're cats. <laughs> That's a whole other discussion. Yeah, I'm not trying to give a cat a pill. I'd, I'd rather with, wrestle with my, my bull. Than, with than dogs, my yeah, with dogs, I just put powdered herbs, mix it with a little wet food, and they'll almost always eat them. Yeah. Uh, once in a while, you get a little Pomeranian or something that says, I don't think that's food. You know, yeah. Give him a tincture here. You think that's food? You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> but otherwise, put it on their food and they're fine. Yeah. But with livestock, I mean, they think that's candy. Yeah. You know, goats will chase you around for more. They're, they're terrible to try and get yeah. away from. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, just put it. And, and the other interesting thing that's an important note is that, you know, the dose for a human of a dry powdered herb is a, about a teaspoon, typically, for most of them. Um, but for a 2,000 pound horse, it's a couple of tablespoons. Okay. So how come it's not way more than yeah. that? Right? Yeah. I mean, you'd think it would be a half a pound right. based on weight. And so you have to start to say, well, why is that? And I, I think the reason it is, is because horses are still eating what they're supposed to eat. And the herbs have less to overcome. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, that's my th hypothesis anyway. But it really is true. You know, you can you can treat a horse or, a, or an adult cow with a couple of, you know, big rounded tablespoons full of herbs. Yeah. And it'll be just as effective. Oh, as man, yeah. As Put it, it a little you know, alfalfa, give them a, half a, a pound little bit of grain. We don't get yeah. a lot of grain, but that's a good moment to yeah. just make it easy to take in and ingest. Yep. <laughs> wow. Well, there, certainly, there are... Certainly, if they're not eating, you just mix that powdered herb with some water and drench them with it. Yeah. You know, that's easy, yeah. too. If you got a little calf with scours that's really in bad shape and isn't eating or something, oh. you know, you can do that. What's a, what's a, we, we actually lost a calf to scours in, in this, this season and uh, really busy, didn't catch it. Mm -hmm. By the time we did, it was too late. But is there is there a good herb for, for scours? Oh, absolutely. The, the, the best herb in the world for shutting scours down is angelica seed. Angelica seed. And okay. angelica is super easy to grow. Okay. Um, it's a cousin of your lovage that you've got back here. Looks uh -huh. just like it. Okay. You know, big tall guy. All right. um, but you just let the seed dry on the heads and then harvest it and just feed them the seed. Yeah. Uh, but it's the best thing in the world for diarrhea and dysentery. Sage is also very good. Just yeah. garden okay. sage like you stuff your turkey with. It's really, really good oh, for wow. diarrhea and dysentery. Okay. And the sage has some antimicrobial properties that help with it too. Yeah. Of course, I'm going to also load them up with some echinacea and some other, you know, maybe some... Oregon grape or something, calendula, yeah. you know, some things to kill some bugs. Yeah. Um, but mainly you got to shut the diarrhea down. Right. Because they're yeah. going to, mostly what they die of is dehydration. Dehydration, yeah. Okay. So. Wow. Well, um, this is, I'm learning a lot just right here. Yeah, and this is an area we need to learn a lot more about. And is, is really exciting to hear your perspective on this. So um, we're about out of time. We got to wrap up. What, um, how can people engage you to learn more? And, and maybe, you know, learn from you how to, you know, build a plan. And, and maybe even you also sell some tinctures, so that's a great way to get started, too, is to get those on, get those on hand if you're not sure. in a place to grow them or you just want to have something ready to go while you're maybe learning the DIY side of it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. What, what, um, so we have, we have two websites. HomegrownHerbalist.net is our primary website. That has all of our formulas. And then I just, about six months ago, started another little website called HerbPet.com for you know okay. dog formulas basically um but either of those sites will have all of our formulas and just shoot us an email and if you don't know what to do we'll, yeah. we'll, or you can do a search on the website too and it'll pull things up but um just send an e email to info at homegrownherbalist.net if you have a specific question i'm happy to help awesome um we also do you know there's blog articles on the website i have a youtube channel channel homegrown herbalist where we talk about stuff yeah. So um, look them up there. You also um, teach classes, both I think in webinars and live. Yep. I mean, you came here and taught a class, so I'm, yep. I'm assuming we do, you're willing to go some. We do live teach events, seminars. Yeah, we do yeah. lots of live seminars and plant walks and things. Um, and of course, we have the school. And uh, one of the really unique things about the school is, is because I was a veterinarian all those years. We talk about all that stuff yeah. in the school. It's, it's amazing to me. You know, we're taught that everything's so complicated and we need to leave it to all of the professionals. And there are certainly places and times for that, you know. 
where, sure. where like you were talking about the mechanics of, of doctors and the you know, things they do that are very, very good. But there's also so much simplicity and things that we can handle right here at home yeah. very easily with just a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of effort. Yeah. yeah and that's, that's really, really exciting and something I've not even thought a whole lot of in this world. So we're, we're gonna dive into that a little bit. Yeah. yeah and hope you guys will too. Uh, Mr. Jones, thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here. It was great to yeah, and hopefully meet you guys. some of you guys will reach out and learn a little bit more. And it's been great to hang out with all of you, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye.